Ruth chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Ruth chapter 3, starting with verse 1. It says, one day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Last week, we learned how God provided. God provides. Now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on some perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. All right, Mama Naomi. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Let's pray. Father, as we enter into this last message of the series, Father, we still come with all of our vulnerability, and we ask you to treat us as we are, nurture us to a place of wholeness, Help us to see and hear what we need to, that we might be transformed. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen, amen and amen. Okay, Mama Naomi, I'm going I'm to be honest right now. This feels a little bit anxious, does it not? Anxious attachment style, it, it tends to be a bit controlling. It tends to manipulate because you don't want rejection. You don't want to be hurt. You don't want to be abandoned. So these type of individuals believe if they can control everything around them, they will prevent themselves from heartbreak. Now, Naomi in chapter 2 has already exclaimed that God is watching her, that God is delivering, that God is providing. He has not forgotten her. He has not forgotten her needs. But in chapter 3, she's like, all right now, girl, let's get into the laboratory because we, we about to cook up some love potion. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to make sure he take good, good care of you. So this is what you're going to do. I want you to put on your best dress. I want you to put on some really nice smelling perfume, not the stuff from Macy's. We're going, we, we going real upscale here. And I want you to wait until after he has eaten it and after he has drank. Now, I want you to know this isn't just drinking Kool-Aid. She's waiting until he's just a little bit tipsy and unaware of what's going down. This sounds like all kinds of mess. This is when, even when God has ordained a relationship, if you start pushing in your own strength and trying to do things on your own timetable, you can mess up a good thing. I need to say that again. <laughs> even when God has ordained a relationship, has told you this is the right person for you, I know a lot of people, and I'm talking to myself, who have rushed a situation and put the relationship, compromised the relationship, made it more fragile because we are rushing to get to the destination, rushing to get to the goal. Naomi, if God provides, chill. I think that love will find a way. If Ruth is still going to be out in his field working, you think Boaz is going to stop looking at her? But Naomi, a little bit, hey, girl, I want to make sure you're taken care of. I want to make sure someone provides it. He's one of our kinfolk. He's, he's, he's a kinsman redeemer. You know, it is his obligation to take care of you. So we're just going to help the process a little bit. I'm so glad that God still works with our messiness. He'll tell you what to do. Now, I will say this. Naomi is really trusting in the character of Boaz. And she's also trusting in the character of Ruth. Many theologians have struggled with this, this passage because they're not sure if this is a euphemism for something else. Commentators sometimes are silent on it. Believe it or not, even one of our great commentators, Ellen White, doesn't touch the story. <laughs> Just like leaves us alone. What happens here? So just as Naomi had said what happened, sure enough, Boaz, he eats, he drinks, he knocks out. 
Ruth, who told Naomi she would do everything that she asked her to do. She has the perfume, she has the dress, she uncovers the man's feet. And the Bible says that he gets startled in the middle of the night, seeing a woman there at his feet. Now, I am going to go with what the word says here, all right? I don't believe this is a euphemism for something else. It's very clear about the position of where Ruth is, exactly where Naomi told her to be. Be at his feet, uncover his feet, hope he gets a little cold at night, wakes up, sees you there, and sparks start flying. I'm just going to trust nature. And so sure enough, in verse 10, he wakes up. He tells Ruth, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of what? Noble character. The kindness that he's talking about that she showed earlier is the kindness that she showed to Naomi by choosing to travel with Naomi back to her hometown when she told Naomi, your God will be my God and your people will be my people. And she chose to be good to her mother-in-law as a, as a daughter, as her flesh and blood daughter. He's saying, you have shown so much kindness and you're showing now even more kindness than that and everyone knows you're a person of noble character. I just want to say this because I think this is so important. All of us who are trying to uh, find that person, all of us who are trying to look for Mr. Wright and, and Mrs. Wright, I want you to know character will always be the most attractive thing you can offer a person in a relationship. Always. I don't care how cute you look. I don't care how many filters you have on IG. I do not care how good you smell. The most beautiful, most attractive, the most hot thing you can ever give to your partner is good character. Because all the other stuff, it going to fade. I mean, that's what Peter says, right? First Peter chapter 3, let not your beauty come from outward adornment, but let it come from where? That gentle spirit, right? That good heart. He says, there the beauty never fades. And I'm just going to be honest with you right now, ladies. I'm going to be honest with you. To get a guy's attention is simple. It's easy. We're men. You're women. You won. <laughs> You've already won. You're in the game. I don't know of a man. I don't know of a man, and somebody correct me afterwards, who has ever looked at a woman and said, bruh, bruh. Look at them earrings, man. Woo! Mm. I got to get those digits. Did you see the necklace? But you, 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 you saw, yeah, I, that's, that's all me. And you notice, did you notice the manicure? Now, all that stuff can be nice and pretty. We're not telling, we're not saying we, we want you to have like messed up toenails and fingernails. I'm just letting you know when you come to us and are saying, how does this look? Is this cute? Is this pretty? Is this great? Our answer is always going to be, yeah. But the things that, that, that men, the men are drawn to is going to be something you'd be so surprised. Yes, like a billboard, you might get our attention with the way that dress fits or your physique and all that kind of stuff. But, but getting our attention on a billboard is easy. Keeping our attention, that's another thing. And guys will have locker room talk, right? And we have locker room. Locker room talk can be so fake. Locker room talk can be so fake. What you want in the locker room talk is the most holy place in the locker. See, the outer court locker room talk is what most people hear about and engage in. But then there's a most holy place locker room talk. This is when all the guys are gone except for those dudes you really trust. And you start saying stuff like this. Bruh, um, she's really cool, man. Really? Yeah, yeah, you mean like, you know, yeah, no, 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 no. She's really cool. And at this moment, guys aren't talking about how a woman looks. They'll be saying stuff like this. Man, she watched the entire Laker game with me. What? <laughs> Man, I was on the phone with her for like five hours, and it felt like five minutes. <gasps> Men, no, this is different. You were on the phone for five hours, and it felt like five minutes? 
I can talk to her about anything. Oh, wow. Lucky. What Peter talks to us about in 1 Peter chapter 3 is what is most attractive about any relationship. And I'm talking to men as well. You can flex. You can have the six-pack. Great. It's a billboard. You'll get attention. You'll get some eyes on you. But to be able to have a good heart, LA Fitness can't give that to you. 24-hour fitness can't give that to you. And these are the things that the Bible celebrates, and I'm telling you right now, don't get off on simply getting someone's attention. What you want is to capture their heart. And earrings and necklaces and six packs and, and the Ferrari do not win hearts. It will win someone's attention. But if you get somebody because you have all the money, you get someone because you have all the fame, you'll know this. They're only into you for that reason alone. And that all gets old. You know that, right? That all gets old. Some of y'all married the most beautiful woman in the world. You saw her for the first time and was love at first sight. But the reason why you celebrate 60 years of marriage isn't because of beauty. Not the beauty on the exterior. It's the beauty of character. It's the beauty of heart. Do you believe that? Man, put, work out. Work out that character. This is what the point of even this series is, is us improving, us growing. And so he says, you're a person of good character, and everybody knows that. And Naomi knows that Boaz is a person of good character. Because if he had wakened, awakened at, at 3 in the morning and saw a woman at his feet, there's all kinds of things that could have went down unfavorably for Ruth. Right? We know this. Remember when Boaz in chapter 2 was telling her, hey, listen, I've told all my workers, all my male workers to leave you alone, to not harass you. I told them no cat calls. I told them don't try to get your digits. I told them to respect you because even Boaz knew the culture of this day. So Naomi had to trust Boaz's character. Boaz trusts Ruth's character and knows that she's not into him just because of money and not into him because of his age. It's not about that. He says, you have shown me so much kindness. So in verse 12, it says, although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer for your family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until the morning. Kinsman redeemer, the law, the tradition, the task, the duty was that any time a person would lose their provider, lose their husband, lose their way of caring for their family, providing for their household, that the, the closest of kin would be a redeemer, would buy them, would take their bad debt, would, would, would buy their property, would bring them into their home, usually through marriage, but they would see it as their responsibility, being a close relative, to care for that family. And so he was a kinsman redeemer, and he has this opportunity to be with a woman he's clearly drawn to, attracted to, moved by, but he says, but I am not the closest one. This also shows you the character of Boaz. Because Boaz, if he wanted to, would have attempted to sign the deal that evening. But he says, no, 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 it's not appropriate. There's someone by law that is closer, close, more closely related to you than to me, more closely related to Naomi than I am. And I'm going to do things by the book. Can I say something, fam? When you truly know you found the right person, when you know that the love is right, it's good, it's from God, you will wait until everything lines up appropriately. If that person says that he loves you, he will prove it by his patience. If she says she loves you and you're the one, she will prove it by her patience. They will want to do things the right way because they don't want to in any way dishonor you or dishonor themselves or bring dishonor upon their God. They will do things the right way. And listen, I'm preaching to myself. There are many times in my life that I have cut corners. I said, Lord, this is the one. I know it. You don't have to send me another angel. I got it. And we'll mess things up. 
will mess things up, put the relationship into a circumstance that is fragile and unsustainable. It is not appropriate. It is not healthy. And when things are not healthy, they get sick and they die. Be patient. Paul describes love. The very first word he describes love in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is patience. Love is patient. That's his first description of love. Not it is butterflies, not it is warm and fuzzy. Love is patient. Chill. And so he says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to make sure that this other person who is more closely related to Naomi doesn't want to be your redeemer. And so he wakes up early in the morning, meets with this family member who's more closely connected, brings the elders of the town, 10 elders, and they surround them. He says, hey, listen, Naomi's back in town and uh, finances aren't really good. Uh, her property is, is to be sold to the closest kinsman redeemer and brother, that is you. And so he's like, ah, thank you. I'll buy it. I want, I want to add to my portfolio. I'll take the property. He uh, one second, bro, one second. Not only will you assume her property, but you will have to also take on her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Whoa, what? Yep, you got to bring her into her household. You have to care for her. You have to give her a child. You have to be the kingsman redeemer. And, and the man is so smart here. He says, it says here in, in verse 6, at this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. <laughs> I cannot do it. Now, what he was basically saying is that my wife would not be happy with that arrangement. <laughs> I'm going to have my kids all upset with me. I'm not about to pull an Abraham with Sarah and Hagar. I'm not to pull, about to pull a Jacob with Rachel and Leah. Absolutely not. I would endanger my life. Can I say something? For those of you who are in relationship, don't endanger your estate. Don't endanger your estate. When God has blessed you with something that is good, don't endanger your estate. I know it looks shiny. I know it looks like you'll have more value, more worth. I know it feels like if it's just a little bit of investment, you're just in the DMs. It's not that. No one has to know about it. I know it might be enticing, but do not endanger your estate. God has blessed you with something good. The grass is always greener on the other side that we say. You know the other saying, right? Water your own grass. <laughs> water, water your own lawn. Everybody who wants to get out of the situation and circumstance that you're in, most of you who have been going through, us with, this, going through with us in this series have talked to me about, that. that's me. That's my partner. They're anxious. They're avoidant. They're, they're fearful. They're shame-based you know, style. I, I, I don't know if I can live with this. It is wonderful for us to be with people who are different than us. It is only by being with people that are different that our own characters are challenged. Most of you think that God puts us together because he's hoping that we can be the happy ending of a Disney movie. Disney movies always end after the first kiss. Not the first year of marriage. The first kiss. And it's a peck, and then it ends. We don't get to see any of the drama, but if you watch Cinderella 2, you'll see some drama. I'm about to give you guys a watch list for Disney Plus right now. If you watch The Little Mermaid 2, you'll see some drama. Oh, Cinderella ain't so happy in that castle. The reality is, is that life is challenging. It is deeply challenging. And the reason why is because you are challenging. Sin is challenging. God doesn't put us together so that it's a happy ending that looks Disney-esque. He puts us together because character formation is the most important goal on this planet. Us becoming more and more like Jesus. Do you think he paired himself up with 12 apostles that were just like him? When the Bible tells us that God marries uh, Israel in Ezekiel 16, Israel is not like him. The beauty in being with people that are different than us 
and have weaknesses in areas where we have strengths is that we're able to partner together and help each other grow. This is not the person for me. Pastor, I'm telling you, they, 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 they trigger me. Yes, they trigger you. And those triggers let you know you have wounds that have not been healed. So what's the real problem? The person who triggers you or the one who refuses to heal? Hello? Our relationship with one another should be forming our character. And watch this, because our relationships here on earth are preparing us for an eternal relationship with God. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. <laughs> the person you married and said, I do, to this person is preparing you to say, I do, to the bridegroom. And that relationship is the most important relationship. That is the relationship that sustains us for eternity. And many of us, because we cannot handle the hardships of relationships here, we give up altogether. And let me tell you something. For those of you right now who are saying, but if my partner was perfect, I'd be good. Let me tell you, if you were married to Jesus, you'd crucify him. I can tell you exactly what perfection looks like. Look no further than Jesus, and he still wasn't enough for his bride. Healing people, bringing dead folk back to life, giving sight to the blind, giving them an encouraging message that wasn't based on legalism, but based on the love the Father had for them. You couldn't ask for a better husband than Jesus Christ. And they still cried out, crucify him. Nothing will make you happy. You could be with Mr. Right and you would be Mrs. Wrong. You could be with Mrs. Right and you would be Mr. Wrong and the relationship would have challenges. Challenges are not an excuse to get out of a situation and find something better. Challenges give us cause and purpose to grow, improve, strengthen, love, forgive, be patient. Should I read again what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says? I say this to every married couple. Love is patient. Love is long-suffering. Love does not record wrongdoings. <laughs> Any of us who have been in love, we record wrongdoings. We are DVRs for wrongs, and we will recall them. We save them in our preferred list. Let me remind you of what you did two years ago. Love, according to Paul, hopes for all things. Trust all things. Love, he says, never fails. Prophecies, he says, may fail, but not love. But read that chapter. It is wrought with tension and striving. Character is so important. We are building character because it is preparing us. Our, our partnerships, our marriages, our relationships here on earth, our relationships with our kids, they're all preparing us for the ultimate relationship with our Heavenly Father, our ultimate relationship with the bridegroom. Do you believe that? The man says, I cannot do it. I don't want to mess with my estate. I don't want to mess with my estate, which was, very, which was very wise. Verse 11 says, then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. Now, a little bit of drama. I know they tried to sanitize that and make that sound cute. It wasn't cute. But I get what they're saying. May your home be blessed. May your home be blessed. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. I love this line. <laughs> May you be famous in Bethlehem. Oh, elders, you have no idea. May you be famous in Bethlehem. You have no idea. And the Bible says that the women said to Naomi in verse 14, praise to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Oh, they're talking about offspring, but they don't realize there's an there's a offspring that would come through her line that would for certain, for certain be famous in Israel, who would renew our lives and sustain us in our old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than Seven sons. Ooh. 
Well, what a dynamic relationship. Has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and she cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of... And you know who came down the Davidic line? According to the Gospel of Matthew, who came through the Davidic line? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. He comes through the Davidic line. Jesus, the greatest, most famous on all of Bethlehem and all of Israel, the most dynamic kinsman redeemer comes through this line because of these folk who were good in character, solid in character, chose to be patient, learned to love selflessly. We see in them an attachment style that is secure. See, when you have secure attachments and you promote secure attachment and you build towards secure attachment, good things always follow. Can I say that again? When you develop and harness good attachment, when you promote it, when you nurture it, good things always follow. It is, it is a scientific uh, 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 rule. It is what Scripture says, you will reap what you have sown. In my life, I told you about my attachment styles growing up. I was avoidant, took that into my adult relationships. And then in my adult relationships, I became an anxious, attached person. And, and again, again, not that the other folk that I was talking to and, and, and falling in love with didn't have their own styles that were dysfunctional. I'm just saying, this, I'm talking about myself, what I was struggling with, what I was dealing with. But God did something beautiful because he does this in relationships. Even some of the ones that, uh, uh, from, from a distance that look like a failure, from those that we would describe that did not work out, God still brings blessings from it. And although I might have had unhealthy, insecure attachment styles, I'm so grateful that unto me was born a child. And my son was born on August 21, 2012. I was also blessed with a daughter that we adopted. And with these children, I learned what secure attachment was. I was able in many ways to, to nurture that little boy that didn't get what he needed when he needed it by listening to my son. When I didn't feel listened to as a young kid, I would listen to my son, and I found myself healing in the process of parenting. Now, some of us work out our dysfunction in parenting. We, 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 we will carry on generational sins and bad habits, and, and we will become physically and emotionally abusive because that's what parents did to us. But I was not going to follow in those footsteps. I took the great traits and qualities that my father, my mother, and my grandparents and aunts and uncles instilled in me, but the things that I knew were a bit toxic, the things that were unhealthy, I said, I want to do better. This is what growth is all about. We improve. We improve. We get better. We do, we, we do better because we know better. And I'm going to tell you this right now. It is not an excuse if your father neglected you, if your father put hands on you, if you felt so belittled, for you to do the same thing to your child. Stop it. You can heal. You can grow. You can improve. And every time I listened to my son and I held my son, I realized something else was happening within me. I'm not trying to be psychoanalytical here. I'm just telling you that I didn't realize that I was repairing damage in my own heart by loving on my son. That every time my son wanted to fight with me before he went to bed because he loved it. We wrestled every single night. So from the minute he could stand, I was body slamming him. I'd say, all right, son, good night. I'll see you in the morning. Ah, boom. Oh, he wanted to fight every single night. But I realized in fighting with my son, there was a, a, a child in me that longed to fight with his own father. 
And I know my dad has his demons. I know that my dad, a Vietnam veteran, my dad who struggled with, with addiction, I know there are certain things that he was, he was paralyzed to do. I get it. I get it. I have forgiven my father of that. But I'm just telling you right now, as a kid, I didn't understand why he wasn't around all the time. But I made sure that with my son, I was going to be there all the time. Even when co-parenting schedules were set up and I knew I was going to miss out on time, I'm telling you, I did whatever I could do to just steal a moment, five minutes, an hour. I was going to see my son as often as I could because I knew not only was I preventing unhealthy attachment style with him, but I was also healing the unhealthy attachment styles that I had developed. Right now, with my son, and with my daughter, there would never be a doubt in either of their minds how loved, how cared for, how supported, how protected they are. It got to the point that even when I wasn't around Nathan for a day or two, I still felt secure and so did he because we had developed this attachment that was healthy. And what happened in that relationship between my son that was healing me was also healing me with God because I had learned that I had developed an anxious attachment style with God. I had an insecure attachment style with God. God, okay, don't worry. I'm going to do better. I know I have more light, so you expect more from me. You may, you, you're you going to be more upset with me than you would anybody else. Don't worry. I'll be good. And as I loved on my son and as I loved on my daughter and as I protected them and was there for them, God was telling me, don't you think I'm at the very least like you? At the very least like you? And then verses started coming to my, my mind as Jesus said, what father among you? If your son asked you for bread, you would give him a stick or give him a stone or give him a snake. What, what, if you who are evil, you who are sinners, know how to give good things, how much more your heavenly father, who is perfect? And then I started to realize God is perfectly and healthily attached to me. His attachment to me is secure. Paul says nothing can separate us. Nothing can separate us. Not even death. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Securely attached. And this is what I want you to know, family. Your God is attached to you. Even when you can't see him and even when you're not around, he is wanting to develop in you a healthy attachment style that even when you can't see him in your darkest hours, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That in the next breath you'll say, but into thy hands I give you my spirit. I know you're there, Dad. I can't see you. I can't feel you. But I know that you are there. I want to share something with you really quick, and we're closing on this, family. I want to show you really quickly what healthy, secure attachment looks like so that when you see it, you can identify it, you can encourage it, and you apply it not only to your relationship with your partner, with your children, but you can apply it and strengthen it with your relationship with God. Just a few characteristics here. Characteristic number one, people who are securely attached have emotion regulation. They don't depend on others to regulate their emotions. They have their own internal emotion regulation, right? They know how to say, mm, my needs aren't being met in this moment. I'm not going to emotionally react. They become less reactive and don't need others to regulate their emotions. Number two, they have healthy boundaries. Because they're not seeking approval through pleasing others, they set up boundaries to prevent burnout or being taken advantage of. These are healthy people. They know how to say no. People who have this healthy attachment style, they're emotionally vulnerable. Because they grew up having their feelings validated, they also feel safe now to share. So if you did not feel safe to share when you were growing up, learn to develop that in the relationship you're in right now. Tell your partner, I'm not feeling safe enough to share my emotions. I just want you to trust these, this is my, these are my emotions, I'm having a reaction, and I want to be able to share them and, and know that you're, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to leave you. I'm not trying to abandon you. I just want you to know how I feel. Can this be a safe space? 
Those who are healthily attached and have security, they're flexible in relationships. Flexibility is a sign of health, not just physically, but also emotionally and cognitively. They can be flexible and say, all right, we'll adjust. We'll adjust. We can compromise here. They're also more willing to trust because their parents were trustworthy. It's easier to trust people and caregivers. They'll see the cup more often than not half full than half empty. They'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Isn't that nice for someone to give you the benefit of the doubt? They also feel and express empathy because someone was empathetic towards them. It's easier for them to be empathetic towards others. So when you're not an empathetic person, it'll let you know very clearly your attachment style most likely is not secure. They're also effective communicators. They believe in communication. They've learned at a young age that communication is not going to ostracize them. So they've learned to communicate and they've learned how to effectively communicate. They have healthy independence. They're not, they're not, they're not so extreme that they're avoidant, no, but they have healthy independence. In other words, they see themselves existing outside of their partner, even outside their family. And I had to learn that even with children. I had to learn that, that my identity is not just as Nathan's father, but I'm also just Jonathan. That my identity is not just Pastor Henderson, my identity is still Jonathan. They've learned healthy independence. And I love this one too, they accept imperfection. They don't need the rigid control in order to feel safe. They're okay with things having faults, with things being imperfect, imperfect. They're okay with it. They realize it's a part of life. So when people make mistakes, they go, you're just being human, I get it. They can, they can roll with that. And the last thing I wanna, wanna state, and this is one of the things that I wanna see in this church and I wanna see in our community, and I know that God is creating a kingdom of, they are peaceful people. There's no warring, they are peaceful people. There is such an advantage of having a secure attachment style. And family, I want you to have that. Most of us are seeking companionship. You just want someone to validate you, someone to make you look pretty, someone to tell you you're amazing, all that kind of stuff. You are just simply looking for companionship. But God is wanting us to have relationships. Relationships are deeper than companionship. Relationships are transformational. They're gonna, they're gonna work on your last nerve, but that's okay. You gonna grow, and so will they. And God wants more than just companionship with you. He wants a relationship with you. He's not just there to pat you on the back. He wants to challenge us. He wants us to grow. He wants us to heal. And so there's someone here today. As I invite the praise team to come forward, there's someone here today. We're gonna sing, we're gonna sing again, draw me nearer as we close out this series. But there's someone here today that wants that secure attachment. You want to experience that with God. You want to experience that with your partner. You want to experience that more healthily with your children. You realize that you've been running away. You've been running away from growing because it hurts. It's painful. Growing pains are literally growing pains. But you are willing to do it because you know that healing is what's going to make things good again. Healing will bring things back in alignment again. Your, kin, your kinsman redeemer, your kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, came a long way to let you know you don't have to run anymore. It's okay if you're triggered. He'll take us just as we are. He just wants you to draw near. And if you remain in me, he says, I will remain in you. Attached, detached from me, you can do nothing. But attached to me, you can do all things. How many of you want to do all things? How many are ready to put the past behind you, heal that child in you, and grow into healthy, strong adults and children of God? If that's where you are, I want you to stand to your feet as we sing this last song. Father, you see your children that are standing. They're looking into your eyes right now, wanting to know if you are secure, if you're a place of refuge. Will they be protected in your arms? Can they be emotional in your arms? Can they express their most vulnerable needs and be met by your embrace? And Father, through this series, you have let us know you are here. You're going wherever we go, that you are a provider and that you will be a secure person for them to attach to. 
Father, we're looking for transformation. We're not just looking for companionship, not someone we can just go hiking with, someone that will help us transform. It'll be painful, but we know that we're working towards healing, so it's worth it. Thank you again for the love that you've shown us. Thank you for being our kinsman redeemer. Thank you for being the redeemer that redeems us from all sin and death and all dysfunction and unhealthiness. We look forward to being in your warm embrace again. We look forward to the bridegroom. Come, Lord Jesus, come soon. We want you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.